That's wonderful. Yeah, we thank you so much that it's that we can sing of our love forever for you because your love for us is everlasting. And we thank you that's because of that love we can know an eternal hope, an eternal joy in Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. And thank you guys for serving us so well. We've got Joe here bringing us a word. Why don't we just give Joe a round of applause? Give him a welcome. I'm just going to pray for you if that's all right, Joe. Yeah, Yeah, Lord, we just thank you so much for all that you've been saying to us this far, thus far this morning. And we just pray, continue to keep our hearts and our ears open to you. That, yeah, again, we just, we don't want to just be hearers of the word. We want to be doers as well. So we just say, we surrender afresh to you. And we say, continue to shape us and mold us in your love. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Good morning, church. Um, my name is Joe. I'm a member of the church here uh, at River Church Sutton. It's so great to um, see so many words coming through um, for our time of praise and worship there. It's so encouraging. Um, and I really want to build on some of the themes that were coming through there. Um, and today we're going to be looking at continuing our, our sermon series on the Lord's Prayer. Um, you may know this story. There's a famous story about a Korean orphanage uh, during and after World War II. The orphans, even though they were rescued from their situations, even though they were well fed and they were cared for, their daily needs were being met, they still couldn't sleep at night. Even though their comforts were there, even though they were being cared for and looked after, they still struggled to sleep because they were still suffering from the trauma of the life they'd been living up to at that point, of not knowing what, whether or not their daily needs would be met. And so the nurses running the orphanage, they consulted a psychologist, and he came up with this really novel idea of suggesting that every night when, when the nurses put the orphans to bed, they put a lump of bread in their hands. And that bread is not there for them to be eaten there and then, but it serves as a reminder that tomorrow their needs will be met. And it worked. Amazingly, it worked. They, they slept better. They were more reassured. They were comforted by just this symbol and this gesture of their constant and daily provision. For these children, it was a simple reminder that their daily needs will be provided for. And it's a powerful picture, isn't it, of how we all take comfort when we know that our needs are being met. Um, today, we're going to look at how Jesus uses bread in the Lord's Prayer as a symbol and as a vision of intimacy and dependence on the Father. As I said, we're in a, a preaching series looking uh, at the Lord's Prayer, and we've come to the section where Jesus talks about daily bread. Um, so if you have a Bible, do open it to Matthew 6, verse 5. I'm going to read from the, the way that Jesus introduces the Lord's Prayer, and then we'll read through the Lord's Prayer in its entirety, just as a reminder. So Matthew 6, verse 5. This is Jesus speaking. He says, When you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So Jesus says, when we pray, we should ask for daily bread. What does that mean? Well, on first reading, 
It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Daily bread is being used as a shorthand for God's ongoing provision for every part of our lives. So when you pray, ask God to get to give you what you need as a recognition of, of what James says in chapter 1 of, of his letter, that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights. Everything. Not just food and water and your daily sustenance, but every good and perfect gift is from above. So your health and your family, your home, your job, and your possessions, all of these things are gifts from above. But everything you're experiencing right now, your ability to breathe, the fact that you can see me, you can hear what I'm saying, you can comprehend my words, these are all gifts not to be taken for granted. So when we pray, Jesus says we should recognize God as our provider. Jesus thinks that this is important. But notice the time scale. Give us today our daily bread. Jesus wants us to embrace a kind of daily dependence on the Father, not an occasional nod to his goodness and provision in our lives, but he's looking for us to cultivate a habit of gratitude. And this creates a totally different mindset in us as we live and have our being. And it's obviously not because God needs reminding. It's not as though God has a checklist every day to tick off all of our needs. This is because we need reminding. Prayer is not for God's benefit, is it? It's much more for ours. And prayer is not a transaction. Prayer is much more than a shopping list of our our needs. It's about getting into God's perspective for our lives and for the world. It's about reorienting ourselves and our priorities into the way that he sees them. Because daily gratitude grounds us and it molds us into a grateful people. In the same way that David says in Psalm 90, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Gratitude is the root to wisdom. This is something that Israelites had to learn when they were in the wilderness for 40 years Um, If you know your Bible well enough, you'll know that when Jesus mentions daily bread, he's obviously referring to the time that Israel spent in the wilderness. So while this is an encouragement to admit your dependence on God, it's also when Jesus talks about daily bread, this is an invitation to a way of life. We see in the book of Exodus that God's people were on two kinds of journeys Yes, they were traveling from A to B. They were traveling towards the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey and rest. They had to physically move from one place to the other. But they were also on a journey of identity. They were slaves in Egypt, and they're on their way to becoming God's people. So if you can just flick back in your Bible to Exodus 16, the text should be coming up uh, above my head. Exodus 16, reading from verse 1. It says that the whole Israelite community set out from Elim and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt. So that was six weeks, about six weeks after being rescued from Egypt. In the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Just notice how the Israelites' perspective is is really quite off. And they have a very rose-tinted memory of what life was like in Egypt as slaves. They claim that they sat around pots of meat and ate all the food they wanted. When in actual fact, they were doing backbreaking work seven days a week. They were regularly beaten. And when Moses had the gall to request or demand that they be set free, well, Pharaoh's response was to increase the pressure on them, increase the amount of work, make it harder for them. 
the Israelites were already doubting God's plan just six weeks after their release from captivity. But God is gracious, and he responds in kind, and he provides manna from heaven. The Lord says to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they, see whether they will follow my instructions. But on the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in. And that will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So God will provide for the Israelites. But there are strict instructions because God wants to test them. You are only to gather what you need for that day. Anything left over will perish. It will not last into the next day. But on the Sabbath, the seventh day, I want my people to rest. So what you gather on the sixth day, there will be an exception, and that really will last into the seventh day. Okay, so God is teaching them daily dependence and rest in him. But what do we see the Israelites do? They ignore it. The Israelites lack faith. They want to take control of their environment. So we see that some gather more than they need for the next day, looking ahead And just as God promised, it goes moldy. And some go out on the Sabbath, trying to get a bit more, trying to get ahead. And there is none, just as God promised. He would not rain down manna from heaven on the Sabbath. This makes Moses angry. God is teaching them about trust. And what looks like a kind of mildly comical episode in Israel's history is actually... God instilling an important lesson about trust. Because the Israelites have seen the raw and awesome power of God in the ten plagues, in the Passover, and parting the the Red Sea for them. He's seen them provide for them in the most amazing ways. But if they're going to reach the promised land, they're going to need to trust God. But we're not much different, are we? We're on a similar kind of journey. While the Israelites, uh, they were in captivity, they were rescued, they went through the waters of the Red Sea, they're now walking as exiles in the wilderness on the way to the promised land. We too were in captivity. We were enslaved to sin. Jesus rescued us and we went down into our own waters of baptism. And we too, now, today, we are walking through our own wilderness, on the way to the promised land of the new creation. And you may feel today as though you're wandering through an unknown country. You may be unsure exactly where you're going. You may feel totally ill-equipped for the journey ahead. Perhaps all you see is lack. Think about your own life. Perhaps you can sing of God's unfailing love on a Sunday morning, but three days later, maybe even three hours later, you find yourself grumbling. When we grumble, we lose perspective. We take our eyes off of God and we place them on our circumstances. And friends, I'm preaching to myself as I speak here. I see this in myself. Perhaps you're like the Israelites who were anxious and tried to gather extra bread for the next day in case it ran out. We know that it went moldy because God was teaching them about daily dependence. On the other side of the same coin, so there we've got a humble, desperate need for God's provision. On the other side of that coin can be our pride. Perhaps today you don't lack anything. Perhaps you feel very comfortable Perhaps you're not worrying about tomorrow or next week or the next month or year. You still need to listen carefully to what Jesus is saying. Isn't it weird? Isn't it weird that Jesus tells us to ask for our daily bread? But just before that, he says that God already knows what we need before we ask it. Isn't he contradicting himself? I don't think so. I think Jesus is teaching us a lesson 
about the problem and danger of self-sufficiency. Because we need to relearn to be dependent. And this is a hard lesson for people who are comfortable and feel like they're in control of their lives. We need to remember that prayer is not about impressing others, as Jesus says. It's not a transaction. It's about intimacy. It's about a daily admission of our weakness. If you don't feel weak enough to pray for your daily needs, then you have bigger problems than you think. You might feel like you don't have any problems, but you're in a worse position than the person really struggling and talking to God about how they're going to get through another day. Your feelings of self-sufficiency can be a barrier to your relationship with God. But let's be honest, we all struggle with prayer, don't we? And we all struggle with self-sufficiency. Perhaps for you, it it feels like a self-discipline issue. It's the same as as going to the gym or, or eating healthy. You just need to be more disciplined. Perhaps you feel like with enough determination, you need more determination to to get into a regular rhythm of of intimacy with the Father. Perhaps you feel like you you just need to be more self-controlled. You know you need to pray. You just let busyness and distractions crowd it out. Friends, I think there are deeper issues than self-discipline and busyness at play. If we're really honest, and if I'm really honest about myself and how I feel, I think the biggest reason we don't pray is that we don't think it will do much good. If you're born in the West, you're born with a can-do Western spirit, that with enough time and energy, we can figure out the solution to anything. And that is helpful, isn't it? And helpful in many areas of life, that can-do spirit, but it is deadly and poisonous to your spiritual life. Because Jesus said in John 15, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's humbling, isn't it? Apart from me, you can do nothing. Not a little bit. Not a partnership. Not 50-50 or 60-40. or 75-25. Nothing. We can do nothing without Jesus. So perhaps you're a bit like the Israelites who went out to gather manna on the Sabbath. Just to be sure. Even when God told them to rest in him. Thinking like this deprives us of the one thing we really need, which is to admit our daily, desperate need for God's grace in our lives. If that is not the constant cry of your heart, then you're missing out on the kind of intimacy that Jesus promises. And it takes faith to resist the urge to control every aspect of your life. But as Romans says in 14, whatever is not from faith is sin. But friends, there is good news in the gospel of Jesus Christ because Jesus gives us spiritual nourishment. It's hard to trust God. It's tempting to want to take control. And it swings both ways. If you feel like you have lack in your life, it can be tempting to scheme and plan and figure it out yourself. But if you don't feel like you have any lack, and you feel like you don't need God, both attitudes are sinful because they fail to consider God's ongoing faithful provision, and it's wicked to reject the giver. But as I said, friends, there is good news in Jesus Christ, because he brings spiritual nourishment for our souls. The truth is, there is a far greater problem than our daily needs. Though God does care about our daily needs, there is a far greater problem, because you have a spiritual lacking that you cannot fix. No matter how much blood, sweat, and tears you apply, you cannot fix it yourself. And there is a chasm between us and God as a result. The problem is our relationship with our creator is broken. And this affects every area of our lives. The Bible says that we are spiritually bankrupt, broken, and barred from God's kingdom. And as a result, the world is full of sin and sickness and suffering. You need the daily bread of God's forgiveness. But Jesus makes a way for us. He rescues us from our situation. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But Jesus pays the price. Jesus takes on himself the world's sin. He makes himself spiritually needy. 
he makes himself spiritually dry. And all of our sin, our rejection of the Father, our rejection of the one who gave us life and being, our self-sufficiency, our prayerlessness, our refusal of his provision, all of this sin is transferred to Jesus on the cross. But friends, it gets better than that. Because Jesus lived the perfect life. He lived in perfect obedience and dependence on the Father. He was the only one who lived a righteous life before him. And the Bible describes this glorious exchange. So in one direction, our sin is placed on Jesus. And coming back in the other direction, unexpectedly, we receive his blameless record before the Father. And this deals with the distance. We can now come boldly with confidence to the throne of God. God chooses to blot out our sin. He chooses to remember them no more. Jesus provides the rescue. But friends, it gets even better. It gets even better than this because Jesus is the bread that doesn't perish. Moses brought bread that went moldy, it perished. But Jesus brings something of infinite and eternal value. He brings us himself. Jesus didn't just come to bring spiritual bread. He is the bread. What does that mean? Well, I think that there is a subtle difference between the kind of Christian who loves Jesus for what he gives us, our identity, our forgiveness and fulfillment, There's a difference between that kind of Christian and the Christian who loves Jesus for who he is. His beauty. His majesty. His perfect character. Jesus is not just the giver of good gifts. He is the ultimate gift himself. Where we see lack whether it's our daily needs or the need for forgiveness, deeper things, Jesus promises to be enough. He says that I am the bread of life. In John 6, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life. To the world. Everything we see with Moses in Exodus and the Israelites traveling through the wilderness and manna coming down from heaven, that is a foreshadowing of what God was going to do in bringing the real manna from heaven. Uh, the band would, uh, if you'd like to come back up now, thank you. You may feel as though you don't have the life you wanted. If that's you this morning, if you feel like you don't have the life you wanted or expected, you you can have Christ, the source of life itself. John 1, verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Friends, you can have Christ. If you feel comfortable today, If you feel like you're struggling to pray, if you feel cold and distant from God, perhaps you feel discouraged, take heart because Jesus also says, abide in me and I in you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Perhaps you need to recognize some areas of self-sufficiency in your life. You might need to repent of those things, but friends, be glad because his mercies are new every morning. God provides manna in the wilderness. He will give you hope in your trials. He will provide spiritual refreshment for a dry soul. Trust Jesus for today, and there will never come a day where he isn't enough for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for for bringing us the true manna from heaven. 
not just to help us with our daily needs, but with our daily need for your grace in our lives. Help us to love you, Jesus, as the lover of our souls. Not just for what you provide for us and what you give for us, but for who you are, your character, your beauty, your majesty. Lord, I pray for those of us that have grown tired and cold and weary and lukewarm. Lord, I pray that you refresh us this morning with your spirit. And for those of us that who all they can see is lack and need and daily struggle, Lord, I pray that you would show them that you are enough, that you would be a satisfying portion for them. We praise you, Lord Jesus, for being our daily bread. Lord, help us. Raise our spirits now. Help us to come to you with our needs. Spiritual, physical, existential, everything. Help us to come to you as the giver of good gifts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.